I do believe that the, like just like the smartphone, we got to a billion smartphone users in 2011. Uh, we'll get to a billion uh, metaverse users in 2027, plus or minus a couple years. And uh, but I do think we'll get to a billion um, AI generative AI users um, by uh, by next year. Welcome back, everyone, to the Geeks, Geezers, and Googleization Show, the home of Googleization Nation, where we talk with HR and business thought leaders about the crazy shift going on all around us and explore the disruptive convergence of technology, business, and people. Here are your hosts, Ira Wolf and Jason Cochran. Hey, welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Geeks, Geezers, and Googleization. Thank you for being part of Googleization Nation. And I'm Ira Wolf. And I'm Jason Cochran. If you think this is just another podcast, think again. We're the voice of the most important conversations on the future of work that's confronting business leaders and people today. And as you know, well know, our goal is to bring you ways to reimagine tomorrow as we explore the ever-changing convergence of business technology and people. Jason, there's one question that keeps bouncing back at me whenever I'm speaking or being interviewed or just talking to people. And the question is, what on earth is Googleization? So Googleization is a term that initially emerged from the shower a couple of years ago when I was writing my 2008 book about the four generations in the workplace. It described the fusion of the tired, the wired, and the world of technology. But as all things tech, it too evolved and transformed into the convergence of people, business, and technology. But hold on to your headphones, Googleization Nation, because while I was gearing up for today's show, a fresh interpretation materialized straight out of my book, Recruiting in the Age of Googleization. It's the moment when reality shakes hands with science fiction. That's what we're going to be talking about today. And while while we are here almost halfway through 2023, reality has become BFFs with science fiction. From the chat GPT to the expansive metaverse, we've got a lot to explore and buckle up because this is gonna be one heck of a ride. So let's imagine for a minute, generative AI. Some of you know that as chat GPT. It's a technology that has the ability to create, innovate, and potentially outthink us all. Well, last year at this time, it was merely science fiction and almost 8 billion people on the planet never even heard of it, but guess what? It's here, it's growing. And now we're talking about how long until 1 billion people harness its power or how long until it becomes a cornerstone of our global economy. But we're gonna be asking a lot of those questions today and for the weeks and months to come because we're not afraid to ask those questions here. And Googleization Nation, we're just getting started because we are so fortunate to have today Doug Hohulen on the show to, to help us understand all this. And we're going to be paying attention to spatial, uh, spatial computing, the metaverse, because one day in the future, the metaverse is going to be blurring the lines between the physical and virtual. It's fast approaching. And it sounds crazy, right? But we're not here just to marvel at all this technology. We're here to ask the questions, to learn and unlearn. And I don't know a better guide we have than Doug. But first, we're going to talk about the perfect labor store. This is where on each episode, we focus on a disruptive, worrisome change that we think you should know. In April and May, just a few months ago, 1.8 billion visits happened on OpenAI. There was almost 90 million visits to Google. Just 14% of our population of the U in the US is using ChatGPT, and McKinsey just came out with this. Automated knowledge AI will generate almost up to $7 trillion. Advanced robotics using AI, 1.7 trillion to 4.5 trillion dollars and autonomous and semi-autonomous vehicles 0.2 to 1.9 trillion that's with the t trillion dollars that means that we're looking at somewhere between 5 and 15 trillion additional dollars coming down the pike really soon due to ai 
And Ira, what's fascinating to me too, is I know we're going to talk a lot about AI today with Doug, but all of this disruption, it's not just AI. Think back just a couple of years ago when stimulus checks were going out in 2020, 11% of young Americans were putting the entire $3,200 into crypto, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Dogecoin, those kind of things. And earlier this month, just out of curiosity, Yahoo Finance was taking a look at, okay, if, if you were one of those 11% and you put your $3,200 in stimulus in those different crypto projects and companies, here's what it would be worth today, June of 2023. So 3,200 of stimulus in Bitcoin would now be worth over $6,000. So not too bad of a return, basically doubling your investment. In Ethereum, it would be worth over $17,000 right now. So even better. And then get this, Dogecoin, the meme coin, it would be worth over $56,000 right now. And the reason I bring that up is it feels like AI is getting a lot of attention right now. But what's really fascinating to me is we've got Web3, blockchain, metaverse, AI. They're all kind of converging and happening at the same time. And one of the questions I can't wait to ask Doug today is, how are they all going to play together? What does this all look like together? Because I think we tend to think of them competing. But what is it going to look like, for instance, like with the Apple Vision Pro, when that comes out, and it's a step in the direction of spatial computing with augmented reality, but what could it look like once it's converged with artificial intelligence applications? Might we all be looking like Tony Stark from Avengers interacting with his artificial intelligence, Jarvis? So we've got a lot to unpack together today. So without further ado, let's give a warm Googleization Nation welcome to today's guest, Doug Huhulan. Well, it's great to be on this channel. Great to be on the show. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for being here. And as you heard, we've got a lot to dig into. There's so much disruption going on in the world. But before we get into those specifics, maybe let's just start here. Tell us a little bit about you and your background and how you got interested in all these topics. Well, I'm a Purdue grad, engineering grad, and uh, I started uh, um, it, as an intern co-op program at uh, Magnavox and worked on automation even then in the early 80s, uh, mid 80s on how to automate uh, processes. So uh, what took a week to, for a technician to do could be automated overnight um, with a one radio channel. So I started that early. Uh, I then moved on to Motorola and uh, did a stint with them for uh, approximately 22 years. Got to travel around the world uh, deploying cellular telephone systems. Then I shifted more into business development and strategy, which I just love. Got to get involved in uh, projects like the 5G Automobile Association, looking at how to deploy um, automated and connected vehicles, what the technology is. How do you change an ecosystem of the old way of doing technology with the new automated vehicle technology? So that was a really fun project. Um, I got, came to Nokia actually as uh, an acquisition from Motorola. And so I was with Motorola and Nokia for 33 years. Um, a year ago, I decided to uh, take uh, to take, do a different shift, evolution and uh, adaptation and uh, working on immersive technology with uh, medical institutions and educational institutions, the KU School of Nursing, and uh, working on ways how we can take the uh, immersive technologies like the spatial web, spatial computing, the metaverse, and how to help with education and also healthcare visualization. And uh, then a year ago, kind of did a, another pivot, I'm now focusing on AI. I'm still very pro, you know, the spatial computing. I, I do believe that the, like, just like the smartphone, we got to a billion smartphone users in 2011. We'll get to a billion uh, metaverse users in 2027, plus or minus a couple of years. And, but I do think we'll get to a billion AI, generative AI users by, uh, by next year. And so it's going to be an incredible evolution. Um, and what the key phrase I like is adaptation, is how are we going to adapt to all this change? And so that's what I'm trying to do as a consultant, working with a number of companies on how to, to evolve and use this technology to the benefit of humanity. 
Well, Doug, we like that term too. Let me get out of the way. For those who are watching, it's the AQ+, plus, which is adaptability quotient. So how do we raise that adaptability in, in organizations? Well, how do we create that within organizations and within people? But with, with all the experience that you've had and, and doing this for 30 plus years and, and talking about automation 30 years ago and bringing up names like Magnafox, people probably don't even know what that is anymore. <laughs> Similar to Motorola used to be you know, all over and, and even Nokia. Have you ever experienced a time like this, looking back? Well, you know, I thought it was a, a crazy ride when we went, you know, like when I started with Motorola in 89, there were 7 million cell phones on the planet. And we got to a billion <laughs> cell phones in 2002. By the way, there, in 1802, there was a billion humans on the planet. So I, I keep track of when do we reach a billion of anything, a billion cars, a billion smartphones. <laughs> You know, so I have this theme of uh, in a blog I posted on uh, when do we reach a billion? But it, it took years. I mean, it took about what twenty years or so to get to uh, you know from the first uh, cell phone phone call was in eighty three, and then twenty twenty uh, was uh, twenty excuse me two thousand two with a billion um, cell phones. But this transition where no one heard about Ch Chat GPT, and now uh, everyone's hearing about it. You know, it's just a crazy you know this amplification of change, and how do you adapt to that? It's just, uh, you know, this is this is moving very, very quickly. I, I don't, want to, don't want to let this go by. And I know if we wait till the end of the show, we might forget. But where's your where's your blog? What, what how do um, get to I, that? I do it on LinkedIn? I post oh, okay, a lot of articles okay. on LinkedIn. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll be uh, I'll run the banner across the screen so, yeah. soon. But you can definitely hook up with uh, Doug on LinkedIn. Uh, and he's the only one. So he's the only Hohulan, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> only which, Doug which, Hohulan. Which, which is pronounced as in no fooling, right? So, right. No fooling. <laughs> so you can look that up. Most of our, many of our listeners, although we're talking about, uh, you know, certainly a lot of people are now familiar with, with ChatGPT. Some may have a sense of what AI is. Can you just break it down real quickly? Because we're throwing out these terms, like everybody understands what they are. So if we can spend just a short period of time here talking about what generative AI is, which is ChatGPT, what spatial computing is and also the metaverse. Sure. So um, so AI is just the ability to achieve complex goals. Well, intelligence is that. And then A, the artificial is how to make, uh, you know, non-biology um, achieving complex goals. And uh, so uh, Gener J GPT uh, and the transformer model came out in 2017, was invented by Google. And no one really thought, oh, this is going to be important. In fact, they, they open sourced it. They, they published it. And it's like, oh, this is kind of interesting. And in fact, uh, um, Kai-Fu Lee, he worked at both in China and the United States. You know, he, he gave a presentation or uh, wrote a book, um, The AI Superpowers. And, you know, he was talking about all the AI and the deep learning elements. But the transformer model, he didn't even mention that. And that was in 2018. So all of a sudden, you know, it wasn't all that interesting. And then, you know, people were starting to little by little, you know, adding more processing power to it, more functionality, and then the user interface. That and just why Motorola is no longer around and Nokia is because Apple came along and did, did transformed the user interface. And that's what OpenAI did as well. So anyway, GPT, a generative pre-trained transformer. Generative, it means it, whenever AI generates something, it's generative is one way, the easy way to think of it. So it's AI generating content. In fact, I just saw one where, you know, more content is generated by uh, chat GPT than all of humanity's uh, content, written content. Uh, so that, that was a couple of months ago. And, you know, from artwork being generated, like with Mid Journey. So it's generating, we're gen just using AI to do all amazing content generation, whether it's videos, audio, images, and then text as well. And then it's pre-trained. So the other, the th key question is, is, you know, what do you train it on? And, uh, you know, so, you know, do I train it on everything, right? You know, it's like a college student, you know, do you give them, throw them, you know, give them all kinds of information or do you target the information? You know, like Google, you know, has come out with MedPalm and Security uh, Palm, which is focused specifically on, you know, they're going to school to become medical experts or going to school to become security experts. And they do a lot better job than if you just say, here's a whole bunch of general information and now become, you know, use that just to become an expert in medical. So anyway, there's, there's, you know, these, you, you, what kind of data do you put it in? 
There's also something called um, reinforcement learning with human feedback or with feedback in general um, to say, okay, how do I train it and say, hey, this is a good answer or this is a bad answer. So it's, it's like your AI going to school, right? And now you're taking tests to say, did I do a good job and did I do a bad job on the answer? And uh, so that's the pre-training. And then the transformer um, is the, the model, um, which is very simple, actually. Uh, the transformer model, it, it, like I said, it came out in 2017. You know, attention is all that ma you need is the title of the uh, the art, uh, the the paper that that kick started this. And again, it wasn't all that interesting until all of a sudden, and, you know, just like Einstein, I think, you know, he had that year, what, 1905, I think it was, where all of a sudden he just, you know, when you know he talked about discovered you know proved the atom existed he uh you know he did rel uh, special relativity so he had just this amazing year and 2022 uh, was that year of uh, this where where all of a sudden everything all the pieces came together and we just made this amazing transformation of uh, what ai could do to generate amazing things and with that doug i mean you brought up einstein at, at what point is AI going to eclipse the brightest of us humans because we hear there's many terms used around AI. There's artificial general intelligence. There's artificial super intelligence. What are the models showing us in terms of when is it going to be considered quote unquote superior to human intelligence? Yeah. Yeah. The interesting thing there is, you know, like I think there's like about 150 different tests um, that measure intelligence, right? And, you know, is it medicine? Is it, you know, theory of mind test? Is it, you know, legal? You know, all these different tests being done. And so there's still a few um, things that humans do better, but more and more things with more and more processing power and better training models where you can actually now, I think the, what is it? The, where you, you know, it's like 95% of the, uh, you know, the top 95% of all humanity is the smartest them. The IQ, yeah, excuse me. IQ is uh, like, I think 153 right now is with this generative AI. The one thing is, uh, you know, and when I give presentations and workshops on this technology is, is this is like a, the smartest teenager, you know, right? And they can do amazingly positive things, amazing, incredible things, but they can do amazingly stupid things. Uh, you know, <laughs> common sense, right? So the, the, the better, the, the strong, the more powerful the tool, the more it can do, but it can also do harm. So, you know, the one challenge for humanity is how do we shape our, the, this AI tool for the benefit of humanity, this alignment, right? How do we align with human goals? I think it's going to be very critical and that that's going to be our challenge, right? Is I'm not so concerned as much as, as the AI taking over, but humans using the AI tool to do bad things, either from malice or not knowing how to use the tools properly. So when AI develops a prefrontal lobe uh, <laughs> for, for that maturity, right? We'll be in trouble. And, and Doug, you're, you're obviously a lot smarter than I am because I'm a stats guy too. I wrote a couple of books and it was one, my first book, Perfect Labor Storm Fact Book was literally just a hundred page of facts about what the future of work was going to look like. It was just stats collated from everybody. You, you created this 1 billion, you know, stuck with one. That was a lot easier to remember than, than a whole variety. But what, what's interesting is, and you mentioned, I'm glad you brought this up because there's a lot of press out there about, well, the chat GPT or AI can already think 28 million times faster or, or a laptop just with the processor is 28 million times faster than what our human brain can think. And we know that we can put in a calculation and just like that, it figures it out. And then, so we're looking in a future with even quantum computing and they're talking like 158 million times faster than, than the fastest supercomputer. So there's all these stats out there that we can calculate information faster we can consume information faster it doesn't mean it's smarter it just means it, it can analyze it and we still need the human beings to figure out if it's accurate because i've run a couple searches and it'll come up with these i, I said include references include sources and it includes sources that don't exist exactly. I mean, they, they sound official they give me the date they give me the publication the volume the page number and when you, well, I say it doesn't exist when I search for it on Google, at least it doesn't search, it doesn't exist on Google, which means it probably doesn't exist uh, at all. So we, we, we still have to be careful with that. But with that, what are some of the 
I, I guess there's people here, and I want to make this relevant because there's a lot of people here that just still might dismiss this, that this is all fun and games, but um, yeah, they're in a job or they're in a company or they're in an industry or they're low, you know, they're centers of influence. Just say, you know, I'm 55 years old or 65 years old or 40 years old. I'll never see this affect me. What's your advice to them? I mean, how, well, what are some of the, how, how is this going to affect us now? And what are some of the best use cases you see that you're excited about? Well, I'm a lifelong learner and I'm actually, I'm part of this organization uh, called Bookflow, where we're a group of learners. And in fact, you talk about uh, the, next, uh, the future of work and uh, Gary Bowles actually is part of our group. And he, he came in and talked for f- five weeks and he wrote the book, The uh, Next Rules of Work. And um, I'm also part of this other organization called Next Collabs, and he's one of the uh, founders of Next Collabs, saying how do we create lifelong learners, right? And how do we understand how to use these, these tools properly? The good news is, you know, if you're, you know, you know, 55 plus, these tools can help you in tremendous ways. Um, you know, I talk, I, I walk with a friend who's uh, a retired nurse, and you know, the ability for to help with cognitive, you know, as you're declining cognitively, uh, remembering things, you know, the question is, is what would maximize your life today, you know, at the end of the day? And, you know, can AI help with some of that, right? How can it uh, help provide better relationships, you know, like connect with people? You know, how do you, you know, get more information to to learn something new? Uh, again, I think if you're not learning something new every day, you're old, right? If you're learning something new every day, you're not old, no matter if you're 99 or, or nine, right? So uh, I'm a big believer in learning things new, uh, find new challenges, no, no matter how hard you are, and then using AI to complement, uh, you know, maybe some of your weaknesses. And, uh, you know, how can you use AI to help you uh, remember things? Like I said, to connect with people, uh, you know, I believe that AI is a tool that can really help improve, uh, you know, amplify the human spirit of creativity. And so I'm excited about that. So if you're a creative person, I would encourage you, uh, especially if you're older, to learn how to use these tools. And Doug, with that, we still have some businesses uh, and leaders, I think that they kind of want to bury their head in the sand and just think, okay, we're just going to keep doing what we're doing. We're still going to be relevant in five years if we just keep doing what we do. In the consulting work that you do, how do you help maybe reluctant organizations or reluctant leaders who are resistant to change or trying out new things, whether they view it as too risky or whatever, how do you help them understand that this is the new business model? Everybody is in the business of innovation or you won't be around in a few years. I think it was Richard Foster, his prediction, his models have by 2027, 40 around 40 percent of the fortune 500 companies will no longer exist how in in your work do you help equip these reluctant organizations or leaders who approach innovation or change artificial intelligence with trepidation yeah well one thing is my dad was a history teacher so i i go back to saying okay what how has your company evolved and adapted over the last 20 years you know because there's been major changes right on how the internet has changed your company how you know, the cellular phone has changed the, your company, how workflow processes, you know, all the new technology. So now the question is what happened in the last 20 years may be happening in the next two years with generative AI. So like at Nokia, when we when I was there, we were we had an XR center of excellence. So we looked at we took people from all kinds of different organizations within Nokia and said, OK, here are all the, the, the processes we have at Nokia. And what things can be leveraged with generative with XR technology? Likewise, you know, you have uh, generative AI, and so like, okay, what processes, you know, in human resource, in manufacturing, and supply chain, every element of your company, you know, how can generative AI help you? Now, there is a, a big danger, and in fact, I, um, Shelley Palmer, I think, just mentioned this in one of his newsletters that uh, you know you know somebody, making sure you understand the security risk right so that's very important as well that you're not using this and you're not you know getting hacked or you're doing things illegally you know using generative ai but how do you put policies in place to amplify your company's ability 
understand your workflows, understand what data and knowledge your company has and how you can use those these tools, just like you're using tools for the internet um, and the tools of the cell phone and the smartphone to, to amplify your ability. And if you think, you know, that changed your business dramatically in the last 20 years, like I said, in the next two years, generative AI will do the same. So if I had to give one piece of advice is uh, create a generative AI um, task force, center of excellence, uh, there's people in your organizations probably that are like you, like me and like you, you two, and, and that are really passionate about this. So grab them and say, hey, let's get together once a, a month with every other week. Let's look at their processes that we currently have in place and how will generative AI change that. And uh, like consultants like myself, you know, we're there to help. And, uh, you know, I just saw that Accenture announced that they have 40,000 employees and they're going to double that to 80,000 employees to, to do this kind of work to help, um, you know, transition very quickly to the old model, to the next models of, of work, the next rules of work, as Gary Bowles talks about. So, you know, but like I said, there, there's people in your industry that likely that they're real excited about this technology. Find them and use them to your ability uh, to maximize, uh, you know, getting your company prepared for this change that's going to happen. Doug, there were so many good pieces of advice there. The one I just want to emphasize real quick that really struck a chord with me was reminding these leaders and organizations, you have changed. <laughs> you aren't the same as you were 15, 20 years ago, but that now it's about this change, as you mentioned, it's going to happen more ra rapidly, more frequently in these shorter bursts. And so just being able to to adapt to it over 10, 15, 20 years, that's not going to cut it anymore. We've got to up the speed at which people can adapt in the organization and make sure the processes and workflows and structure is there to support being able to make quicker change whenever it's needed, as you suggested. Exactly. Well, like tomorrow, I'm actually doing a panel on healthcare. Microsoft, Denise Mead from Microsoft uh, on healthcare and AI is going to be on the panel, as well as um, Dr. Harvey Castro. And he wrote, a, he's a medical doctor and he's written a number of books on uh, healthcare and large language models. And in fact, he had a fantastic panel um, with the, uh, the president of the Amer medical, American Medical Association uh, talking about how medicine is looking at generative AI and these workflows. And, you know, there's uh, 13,000 ways the body can fail. And we have about 5,000 drugs and about 4,000 medical procedures, according to Atul Gawande. And uh, the question is, is can we come up with AI technology that can find these hidden pieces that, that we didn't know about? And if we just took this drug that, that's maybe on the shelf, but we didn't know it could cure this disease, it would transform uh, medicine. So um, I'm looking, I'm excited how AI can help find ways the body can fail and then cure those, those ways. It, it's already helped with one of the ills of uh, medicine in uh, helping doctors express empathy. Uh, oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the study that was out there is, 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 and I can't remember the exact stat, but it was, it was crazy. It was like that the people resonated with what the AI generated, like 70% more times or 70 times what, what it came from the physician's mouth and teaching, yeah. you know, teaching the physicians, here's the dialogue, here's what you need to say, or, or figure out ways when people need to understand why they need to do what they need to do or they need more compassion or caring that they go to a machine <laughs> to get it because it was much better than that forget forget so curing the disease or, or treating the disease or doing the surgery uh it was literally just that human that that interaction from there but this is fascinating and we've got a lot more to explore uh we want to thank everybody for listening to geek skeezers and googleization Thank you for being part of Googleization Nation. Uh, we're talking today uh, with Doug Nohulin, talking about generator of AI, which many of you may know as ChatGPT, spatial consulting or spatial uh, computing, uh, and maybe spatial consulting, but spatial computing, uh, and also the metaverse. And when we come back, I, I definitely want to talk about something that we're talking about in my certification class on uh, understanding the brain and neuroscience at Wharton is that you know we got so hung up on talking about remote work how do you communicate how we've lost connection how we've lost serendipity how we've lost synchronization people aren't connected so you have to come back to the workplace and sitting on the horizon is spatial computing and the metaverse so uh you know how are we going to be able to develop those uh connections there and everybody thought metaverse was dead 
last year and all of a sudden apple releases uh you know their 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 new headsets and we're back in the game uh and, and evolving but we're going to take a really quick break this will probably resonate with you doug because we're talking about adaptability and growth mindset uh we'll be right back stay tuned are your employees feeling stuck and just showing up for a paycheck is your workforce working harder to get back to normal than adapting to the future it's time to help them break their addiction to certainty and develop a growth mindset Developed by one of the world's top-rated future of work thought leaders, AQ Plus Mindset is a powerful tool to help your employees embrace change, adapt faster, and grow on the job. Conveniently delivered to any smartphone or laptop and easy to digest 5-10 to 10 minute lessons, managers can sit back and watch employee attitude shift towards growth and innovation in just 30 days. Are you ready to help your employees thrive in this ever-changing, never-normal world? Encourage them to show more grit, resilience, adaptability, and unlock their potential? The journey to a growth-filled future starts with a growth mindset. Visit aqplusmindset.com or call 484-373-4300. Hey, welcome back, everyone, to Geek Skeezers and Googleization. We're here with Doug Hohulan. Uh, we're talking about generative AI, spatial computing metaverse. Right before we uh, took a break, I, you had uh, brought up about how, how we've all changed. And I am old enough to remember uh, the phone. You probably developed some of these phones back, back in, in the days because I had a bag phone. I had a pager. Uh, they all had Motorola, they, Nokia. They were all over the place, a brick phone. But prior to that, and I, when I was prepping, prepping for this, it, it brought back some old memories, is I grew up in a small coal town in Pennsylvania. And not every, one is, not everybody had a phone. So I was, and this came from your stat of, you know, now how many billions of people, I think there's like 3 billion smartphones. Five, over planet. 5 billion 5 billion smartphones on the Individuals, planet. actually over 6 billion a total of smartphones, but 5 billion people have a smartphone. Yeah. And we didn't have those, by the way, just to, to go back. I mean, the, the iPhone came out in 2007, I think. That's correct. Right? Yeah, so it's not even 20 years. So think about how our life changed. Now, good and bad, because we, we check our smartphones, what, 344 times a day, um, you know, every four minutes. Uh, so they may, you know, it became a distraction, but then maybe it's not even a smartphone, maybe it's not even a phone because most people don't use it as a phone. It's a computer that could, you know, that was much more powerful than send the man to the moon. But when we, when you came back, I was thinking about when I grew up, now we had our own line, but we had one, we had multiple phones, but we had one line and there was no way I could spend three hours on a phone. You know, uh, my, my, my high school girlfriend's now my wife. And, you know, we, I used to try to get on there. My parents said, you know, they keep picking up the phone on the other end to get me off. But there were people who had party lines. They had shared lines. So there might have been eight families within a, you know, a couple blocks that shared the same number to, to be able to get on there. So just and, and again, I know I'm old, but just in my lifetime of, of 60 years, 70 years is all these things changed. Absolutely. And just the other day is like, who has a landline anymore? Well, oddly enough, is the, the most landlines, uh, I think this was from either Pew or Stati- uh, Statista, the most landlines, and it's really odd, are in the Northeast. And they went through the whole conversation of, is this because of education levels? Is this because of poverty? Is this socioeconomics? Does this have to do with race, uh, education levels? Went through the whole thing. You know, do you know why the Northeast has more landlines than ever before than than anywhere else in the country? I I do not actually. Good. Verizon. Ver, Verizon when all the when AT&T and everybody else got out of it, Verizon basically laid the fiber they went to Fios. Right. And they bundled in the phone. Okay. So it's it's just part of it. You just get it. That's why the yeah. People have, but everywhere else in the country that didn't have the 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 uh, the the, uh, the fiber or or other alternatives, uh, ditched the phone. But the Northeast still hangs on to their landlines. 
um, more than any place else in the country. But yeah, I, I would argue though that the, the one thing people don't do with their phone is make phone calls, right? They they don't talk on it, right? Yeah, especially if you have uh, young kids, you know? you know, like like you text. I mean, the rule now is don't even don't call someone. Text them first and say, "Can we talk? Do you yeah. want to talk to them?" Right? Yeah. So we we kind of glossed over the spatial computing. We keep talking about spatial computing in metaverse, and it, it came up in this week's. In, in this week's module for my certification. And it was about remote work and, you know, of, of how, and, and part of it was how do we create the human connection? And it's, you know, look into the camera. We need to have eye, can eye contact. We certainly can't have social touches or, you know, handshakes. Or, so we don't have that. And that therefore uh, we need to figure out a way to develop that through a screen. Now, I feel pretty connected to you today, but you know, other people may may struggle with that. But with spatial computing and the metaverse, and, and sort of give people a picture of what that is, it seems that we've got a short-term problem, but a, a big solution coming down the pike that it will be irrelevant where people work and will still be able to have that level of serendipity, synchrony, collaboration, creativity, those moments done through a somewhat of a screen or at least in that virtual world. Right. Yeah. And I actually didn't define this as spatial computing. I was in the metaverse and actually Alvin Graylin, um, president of HTC China, I'd recommend people connecting with him and following him on LinkedIn. Very nice person. And he's out of the U.S. and has a view on both sides, the China, the Asian side and the U.S. side. But anyway, his, his comment is the metaverse is the Internet that's spatialized, amplified, powered by AI using these immersive devices, these XR devices. So that's the metaverse. And the spatial web is, is basically the Internet 3D you know, spatialized. So we went from, you know, 1D, which is text. Remember the old days where all it was is just text. And then you went into Windows and it was, it's, you know, you had 2D and now we're going to go into 3D. And uh, so this 3D, uh, you know, the spatial web is 3D. In fact, Dan Mapes, who uh, gave it, we, we reviewed his book, The Spatial Web, How Web uh, 3.0 Will Connect um, Humans, Machines and AI to Transform the World. Uh, Dan Mapes is the founder of uh, Versus IO and the Spatial Web Foundation. And, uh, you know, I recommend his book um, to talk about how the spatial web is going to just evolve, you know, from, uh, you know, from the 2D world of the web that we know today to the spatial web. Now, you know, Apple was real exciting because, you know, Meta came out, Facebook Meta, you know, in 2021, uh, everything was hot. You know, everyone was running to, uh, you know, XR, the metaverse. Uh, and then all, then all of a sudden, everyone lost a lot of money um, because of, you know, it was a little bit early for its time. Um, but like I said, I, I still believe 2027, there'll be a billion people using immersive technology at least an hour a day. And then five years later, there'll be five billion people using this technology. So, you know, and, uh, you know, a, a good example is, is medical. Um, right now, people spend a billion, go to a billion office visits to their clinician a year in the United States. And, you know, how many of them could, you know, be done virtually? And actually they did a study, the CDC did, and you actually have a better survival rate if you're, uh, uh, you know, if you're doing telemedicine visits versus going in person. In fact, I, you know, I think my saying is the uh, least infectious visit you're gonna have at your doctor's office is one you do via telemedicine. So, you know, and, you know, you don't waste the time of traveling to the doctor's visit and coming back. In fact, I did a, a project last year with a KU cancer doctor and a company called MetaView, where we looked at remote uh, telemedicine project. We won $100,000 at the 10G Cable Labs Challenge because of that, on how we can have this immersive technology so that you you feel like you're the doctor's in the same room with you, even though you know you don't have to travel eight hours. Like if you're in Kansas in a rural area, you know you can be right there. And uh, the other thing is the greenest mile and the safest mile you can travel is one that you do virtually. So, you know, right now we do a lot of traveling where it's maybe not that important, you know, and if we could have a, a, a similar experience, a connectivity in, in the spatial web, uh, you know, the spatial uh, computing, the spatial web, 
you know, that would save a tremendous amount of greenhouse gases. So rather than, uh, you know, three grams of carbon dioxide to do a Zoom meeting for an hour, you know, you, you do a hundred or even a thousand times more doing a travel by car or by, uh, uh, by, by plane. So they, you know, the average, uh, you know, if you go to an event, the average event, you'll use five tons of CO2 gas emissions for a three day um, event if you do a, tra- a business trip travel. So, you know, now there's times where it's important to be there in person, right? I'm, I, I did business development and sales. So there's times you really need to meet. But if we can, you know, cut down our, our you know, business travel down by 50% and have the same experience, we save time of that we're not traveling. And, and then we have this great experience. So I'm a really excited um, one solution to uh, climate change will be, uh, you know, this, this spatial web where we don't have to do as much traveling. That's exciting, Doug, to think about the, the three-dimensional aspect of this, because we've all heard about Zoom fatigue, that a lot of people have started to get burned out because now they're, they end up having more meetings because they've got Zoom meetings back to back to back to back. It's exciting to think about maybe the opportunities that spatial computing offers to make those interactions feel more natural like we are in person, whether it's through holograms or being immersed in that environment. Um, that it's going to make it feel more natural. And hopefully, just like I was studying in, in the in the neuroscience class, what we're going to see is a closer replication to what parts of the brain fire up and what good neurotransmitters are released in the in-person interactions. Hopefully, we can replicate that at an even better level with the spatial computing technology. And so I guess with that, that kind of goes into a, 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 another segment we, we often like to ask our guests, which is, hopes and fears. When you think about the future, you've you've shared a lot of hopes and we can hear the optimism from you about a, a lot of the things in the future. Share with us maybe your top hope and then maybe your top fear for the future when it comes to all of this disruptive technology that we're starting to find ourselves in. Yeah, well, you know, AI does a great job at doing connections, finding connections that you may not be aware of. So my hope like, is that it will start finding ways, solving ways the body can fail. Um, like I have a friend that has chronic myelogenous leukemia and the, this drug um, Gleevec came out um, in 2001 and it was a wonder drug. And there's other wonder drugs like that. So can we keep coming up with wonder drugs that solve the way the body can fail? So from a medicine perspective, I'm really excited about AI, um, optimizing people's lives, like I said earlier, um, you know, can we come up with ways to say, hey, well, how can I do things better? Save time. I mean, that's one of the things, you know, as a consultant, I say is look for ways that AI tools can save you an hour a day. Um, you know, like Microsoft, they announced that they're coming out in November now to integrate uh, Office uh, 365 Copilot. Um, you know, and so, you know, they already rolled that out to 20 co- um, cl- um, companies. And then they went to 600 companies and I found the site that said they're going to do it in November to everyone. So if you're using Office 365, you're going to have Copilot. Um, um, you know, that's going to come out in November. So how can you do that? So as I'm writing, as I'm doing creativity, how can I use that to help me write, to help me create, um, to help me visualize? These are the things that, you know, I, I'm still the captain, right? I'm still in control. But I'm using the the co-pilot. I'm using the uh, duet of the AI to do the heavy lifting, and I do the creativity work. So that's where I'm most excited about. And this is coming soon. I mean, you know, Microsoft. Everyone's using, you know, Microsoft, and everyone's using Google, um, and those are coming out. And so there's these amazing tools that can make your life more efficient and the workflow processes. So you know, that, that's where I'm excited. Now, the, the flip of that is. What can be the risks, right? And you know, people are concerned about jobs. Um, but if you're learning, if you're a lifelong learner, you know, and you're using knowing how to use these tools, you know, it's kind of like a farmer. You know, my great grandfather and my grandfathers were farmers. You know, and they were. In fact, my first job was uh, detasseling car corn in a farm field. I do not want to do that, right? And I, I, no one wants to do that, right? I did that as a teenager. So I would say, you know. If a job's dirty, dangerous, difficult, or dull, give that to the AI. As long as you're a lifelong learner, and you know they do the bad stuff, and you do the fun stuff and the creative stuff. So uh, you know, I would ask, you know, what things are you the most interested in, the most creative, and then how do you shape a job that that can do the best? Now, 
again, going back to if you don't use the tool properly, you can use it for hallucination. You know, one lawyer uh, was a good example is, uh, you know, he asked Chad GPT to cite case law. And it's kind of like asking, uh, you know, a surgeon to use a chainsaw for his surgery. Right. You know, it's, it's the wrong tool to use. I mean, <laughs> the chainsaw does, you know, good job at cutting, but uh, not of saving lives um, for surgery. So likewise, you know, know how to use the tools properly. And so, our, you know, I'm concerned about people using AI either incompetently, you know, and not understanding how to use the tools properly. Um, that's one concern I have. And uh, which is why, you know, listen to, uh, you know, events like today, you know, getting consultants to help you uh, use, understand the tools. And then also malice, right, is how do, you know, there are bad actors that use these tools um, for security risk and, uh, you know, that, they, you know, and then people not understanding how to use the tool, they get, um, you know, there's fraud and abuse because they don't understand how to use those tools properly. So those are the two things I would, you know, be aware of fraud, uh, you know, malice and incompetence um, as you're using these technology. So, Doug, we're coming up uh, toward the end, unfortunately. Uh, so there's a couple other things that we like to do. But one of those is always ask our guests, is there something we should have asked you that we didn't? No, I, I think you did a really good job, uh, you know, covering the basis. You know, uh, you know I'm, I'm a real passion about, you know, the future of work. And I'm, I'm just... You know, I'm glad you talk, asked me about that because I'm, I'm passionate about that, too, is is especially for the younger generation, how we can help the younger generation. I guess the one question a comment I would have is how can we help people in Africa and other places that are not as technology literate, how to help them and elevate them? I was actually a, a coach, um, a, a judge at a, a, a Girls in STEAM Institute event. And there were two teams from Kenya, Africa, high school uh, teams. And we were talking about, uh, you know, immersive technology and innovation. And, and you know, the, the one of the teams, they were coming up with reusable diapers and the other one with reusable feminine napkins, right? And so, you know, we have, as a, you know, as a coach, it's like, oh, wow, you know, and so I, I actually helped uh, sponsor some of the, fund some of the their projects. But, you know, we have, here in the West, we have first world problems. And so, you know, the question is, is how can we help people in Africa and other places that may be disrupted the, the most because of factory automation? You know, factory automation will displace a lot of, of workers, you know, and I think that's going to be a risk. So, you know, that would be the challenge. If I, if I say there's any challenge out there is how do we help those who, you know, are, are going to be the most challenged with this technology to to elevate them to to do the best they can be. Doug, I'm going to need you to give me an update on those reusable diapers. I have twin boys that are still <laughs> in diapers. If that works, please let me know because that would save us a lot of time and money, I think, with, with reusable diapers. I am a little skeptical uh, judging by what my boys do to the diapers that they have. But if there is some technology that can do that, I'm going to be open minded and would love to hear about that. So please. Keep OK, I, I'll let you know. <laughs> awesome. Well, Doug, the next segment we want to get to is we get ready to wrap things up. It's called our lightning round segment. Just going to ask you a few questions, not as professional, but more on the personal side. We want to get to know the personal side of Doug and help our listeners do the same. So let's start with this one. What's a favorite band or song or musical event of yours? Yeah, I would say Pentonix. I really like. Um, they did the evolution of mi music, which is music from the 1500s to the present. Also, their harmonies that they bring. There's five um, performers, all a cappella. You know, so they don't need all the, the the technology to do amazing things with with the with their performance. So, you know, it, while you think technology is great, I would you know I would recommend listening to them. That's awesome. I love that. And how about uh, like a superpower? If you were to pick any type of superpower that you could have, what would it be? You know, I guess uh, reading minds. Yeah, I, I think, think to be able to understand where people are coming from, and to under you know under to be more to, to be more empathetic to people, so I can really understand. And so I think reading minds would be a good one. You should, you should join us in the uh, in our certification course at Wharton. Uh, <laughs> on understanding the brain. That's yeah. It, it also helps when you play poker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Absolutely. And how about this one, Doug? If if there's one thing that's like the very top of your bucket list right now, what is that one thing that you still want to do? 
You know, I, I'm looking for my next, uh, you know, I've done a lot of things, you know, traveled around the world um, with work and you know, for personal, but I'm, I'm looking to have these immersive experiences where we don't have to do as much travel and, but we get the same experience. So I think we're still a few years out. It'll be interesting to see what Apple's new product comes out and also um, Facebook Meta with their new product, uh, the content that can be developed with AI um, is just amazing as well. And so, but can we come up with solutions where people don't have to do as much traveling um, and they can have the same human connection? You know, those are the things I'm, I'm really excited about. And uh, so then I can go to, you know, I've been to the Mars, I've been to the moon in, in virtual reality and it's been an okay experience. But, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to it where it's indistinguishable from the physical experience. And uh, I, I think we're within five, definitely within 10 years, we'll be there. And uh, so I want to help roll out that technology. It's incredible to think about those expeditions and being able to do things that a lot of regular folks thought they'd never have the opportunity to do. Actually see what the moon is like, um, to experience those things, to experience what Mars is like. And even for me on a different level, I think it'd be awesome to be able to take my family with four young boys to an amusement park in the metaverse where you don't have to wait in line, but you still get the <laughs> thrill of feeling like you're on a roller coaster. Um, yeah. I'd be all about that. Exactly. So, so Doug, quick question on that. How quickly, I mean, I know we we're, you're talking about a billion people uh, in the metaverse by 2027, maybe. Give or take. Right. We, are, are the headsets going to be any better? I, I, know, I, I know Apple's is so much smaller. But that seems to be part of the challenge. You know, it, it's it's the equipment to get there. Yeah. So um, Qualcomm, you know, they announced uh, at VR AR Association um, where they're working. They have like a roadmap for the next five to 10 years and where you have this, you know, basically offline processing. So basically you just have optics. So I believe that, like I said, in five years, you know, 2027, we're going to have smart glasses and, uh, you know, that you know, come down to, you know, there's already devices like New Eyes is a, a good example. HTC Flow has another um, pair of glasses that are pretty good. Uh, right now, you know, going from a pound to like a, about a quarter of a pound or, you know, 200, 150 grams is a really critical point for life, you know, being able to wear your glasses the whole time. So th that's coming and, uh, you know, it will be lifelong battery, uh, day long battery life so that, you know, just like your smartphone, right? Now, the one comment I would say is, is there's this concept of diminished reality, right? You know, in fact, you can Google uh, hyper reality and it's you know, where you just get overloaded and bombarded, you know, like you're at a rock concert, right? But diminished reality is like, what are 10 things you need to know right now? And how do I diminish everything else around it? So like when you're with your wife or your significant other, you know, your kids, how do you diminish, like get rid of all the other distractions and say, hey, I'm going to get in a flow state and be focused on the things I really care about. And yeah, yeah, you know, if all of a sudden something comes along that's really important, then it comes in. But diminish the reality, the, the noise around you to focus on the important things. And I think technology can it can help with that if, if deployed properly. If not deployed properly, we're going to be bombarded with, you know, 344 times a day. We're going to be going to our smartphone when we should be focusing on things that are important. So if I have to leave it, one thing is focus on the importance and use the technology to help you focus on the important. Perfect, Doug. And with the glasses, you and I are trendsetters, I guess, already, Doug. A lot of people are doing everything they can to get out of wearing glasses. You know, it sounds like you're saying here in about four years, everybody's going to be trying to get into wearing glasses for the yeah. experience. Well, well I think 70% of people uh, have glasses, right? Uh, they wore glasses and, and you know, there's, there's sunglasses as well. So people are used to wearing those. Um, already, like with uh, earbuds, you know, we can, you know, like if you look at your five senses, you know, we can make sound indistinguishable from the physical experience, right? And so the question is when can sight, when can smell, actually smell, they're coming out with that as well, that you have this, you can have all the, like 3000 different, you know, smells or an odors. Um, so like, can you have that? In fact, I think it would be real, you could sell that to people who have loved their dogs and figure out, you know, what, kind, what smell would their dog love the most, right? <laughs> and to get them excited about that. So, you know, sight is going to be interesting to see. But, you know, what I understand uh, from reading the reviews of the ProVision, you know, for $3,500, they, they get very close to indistinguishable from the, the phys, you know, visual world. 
And, you know, as that price keeps coming down, as the device keeps getting lighter and lighter, it's going to be an amazing experience. And then powered by AI so that if I want to see the physical world and mix, it's called mixed reality or augment reality, where I mix, you know, the phys, you know information on top of, of the, of the uh, physical world. Or if I want to go virtual, like let's say I, I want to go to Mount Everest, right, without the risk of dying. Or I want to go to the Titanic, right? I, you know, you can do that virtually without having to be in a sub that will kill you. So, you know, it's, you know, the safest thing is place you can be is virtually instead of a very dangerous physical world. So, you know, I'm excited about what's possible in the next five to 10 years. Doug, this has been absolutely fascinating. We're going to have to get you back again so we can take a, a deeper dive and also see how many of these predictions are coming true because we know they are coming down the road. Again, to connect with Doug, LinkedIn is the best way to find Doug and the work that he's doing. Doug Hohulin, the way that you spell his last name is H-O-H-U-L-I-N. Doug, any other ways uh, aside from LinkedIn where people can keep up with you? Yeah, that's probably the easiest way to connect. And I, I post a lot of material on other ways you can get to me. Like I'm working on a number of different projects with different companies and a lot of exciting times. And, uh, you know, maybe one comment is, you know, the EU AI Act. I'm working with a company called AI Partners on, you know, regulatory. And that's going to, you know, if we come back, maybe we'll talk some about that because, you know, how do you how how does government think about this rollout of this technology? You know, is is you know, it's going to be an interesting ride over the next few years. And uh but uh, it's, it's an exciting ride, and I think it's one where, you know, if you look from a future work perspective and adaptation, you know, it's going to be, you know, as you said, the shift, this, is, this amazing shift of, of, uh, of where, we're, where humanity was and where it's going um, is going to be an exciting time. So looking forward to being part of that. Thanks so much, Doug. Uh, big shout out to Shelley Palmer for making our, our introduction. Shelly, uh, uh, as many people did in, in when the when we locked down, we're looking for ways to to continue that connection that we had from not going to places, and uh, we you know we did it through Zoom, so two dimensional uh, spatial uh, uh, computing, uh, but uh, it was we we kind of kicked it off right away, and we had a couple conversations and uh, talked about VR, but. Uh, so shout out and thank you to, to Shelly. But thank you for being part of uh, today's Geek Skeezers and Googleization. I'm sure this is going to be uh, one of our most popular episodes, similar to the one I know you reviewed, you 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 shared about uh, John Asani. And uh, and that, again, has, has been one of our, in six years, one of our most popular episodes, both of his. He was on twice. So we'll get you back as well. And uh, really appreciate it. Thanks for uh, keeping us uh, in tune with what's going on. Well, thank you for this opportunity. Great talking to you both. Okay. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, Doug. All right, we covered a lot of ground um, in a short amount of time there. I can't wait for folks to give it a listen and then re-listen. I know I'm going to be re-listening to this one because there were a lot of yeah, wonderfully I deep snippets that Doug shared. What were some of the big takeaways for you today? I, I think the one, there, there were two. The one that stood out, I got to look at my note here. He talked about what can companies do? And I love the idea of like an AI task force. And, and again, I know mm -hmm. things get hung up and, task forces but you know maybe it's a book club you know maybe maybe companies can have a book club and just you know pick out some some books beyond the, the traditional safe hr book you know here's or you know workbooks or leadership book you know what what can we do and and some of the books you know the clubs that uh, doug has what can you do to take out a book that may seem way out there but the reality is it's not so i, I just read a post by chip conley this morning and he talked about her the, the movie Her, and a lot of people, when it came out in 2013, uh, it was a movie with Joaquin Phoenix, were really turned off. They were really mm -hmm. turned off with, with a, a human being falling in love with a machine, with his phone. And now we're realizing that there may be some possibilities and there's some benefits to that, and, and especially with so many people being lonely. So that was sort of a, a little bit digression there, but I think that AI task force or, or book club. Uh, but the other was the impact of. Um, on climate change. So we, we look at this from productivity standpoint and from work, but we definitely need to do that. But I, I think when it comes down to it, that, you know, just going away to a, you know, having a concert or going away to a three-day conference, how many, how many tons of, of gases are emitted? And if, if uh, spatial computing, the metaverse AI can help uh, mitigate that, reduce it, not eliminate it. We're not talking about all, 
but eliminate that. Those there, those were two of the, 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 I guess, the big topics, but there were so many. There were so many. The one that's really stood out to me, too, I was today's year old when I found out that there are approximately 13,000 ways that the human body can fail, which causes us to die. Like, I've never spent time wondering, I wonder how many different ways there are for our bodies to fail where we would pass away. But to know that there actually is a mathematical number out there <laughs> that helps us understand that. And then Doug was saying, and AI is going to be able to help us understand the solution for every 13,000 of those different ways that our bodies can fail. Like, there really is this tremendous opportunity amidst all of the fear and dread that we hear of, of AI to really help us take that next step of advancing the quality of our lives, of helping to improve climate change, like you said, of us helping to understand how to treat and deal with certain types of diseases that cut our lives too short, where we can still have quality of life. And I'm really excited about all those things. And I appreciate Doug's perspective on that and that he's helping other organizational leaders to adopt that same mindset of being curious, of being optimistic of the direction that we're headed and how we can leverage these things to make the world a better place. And, so, and for you, solving a diaper problem. <laughs> for me, solving a diaper problem. <laughs> Let me tell you, that happens. Sign me up. We've got a lifetime subscription. We are definitely getting that. And with that, Googleization Nation, I want to thank you for tuning in today um, to today's episode. If you have not liked and subscribed on your favorite podcast platform, please do so. And also do the same on YouTube. We are growing our YouTube audience. We're also growing on Instagram. So give us a follow on there as well, because we love sharing video shorts and things to capture your attention to some of the highlights from the show. But until next time, I'm Jason Cochran signing off. And I'm Ira Wolf. Thanks again for listening to Geek Skeezers and Googleization. Thank you for being part of Googleization. As Jason said, please sign up. Uh, you can go to googleizationnation.com. You'll get uh, weekly uh, newsletters and, and periodic uh, events that we're, that we're holding. And also, uh, please uh, subscribe and like us on Apple, Spotify, or wherever, or YouTube. We, we now have on my channel, we have over 10,000 subscribers. So thank you. Uh, we're up 8,000 over in the last uh, three to four months. And uh, we on our uh, Geek Skeezers and Googleization YouTube channel, uh, we have over 2,000. So appreciate uh, all, you know, everybody who's doing that. And uh, please continue. We're, we'll keep bringing on people like Doug. And we've got a great, great lineup in July. Next week is the 4th. We'll be taking that off or the 5th, but we'll, we won't be doing a live show next week, but you can always go up and listen to some of the replays on YouTube, Apple, Spotify. So thanks again, everyone. Appreciate it. Be safe and don't let the shift hit your plans. Mm -hmm.